Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. Happy Resurrection Sunday. <laughs> I hope you are in a good spirits and you realize he is risen. The tomb was empty, folks. We all know that. We're going to jump into it today. And uh, I know there's folks out there that still need prayer. I want to keep you all in prayer. Um, obviously, we, have, we prayed for uh, Mike recently. Mary, my buddy Pete's family member, has gone through surgery. There's still some road to go for recovery and I believe Carlene and Ray's son went through surgery and still need some prayer as well so there's lots of folks out there for prayer but today's focus is our resurrection message 2022 he is risen we will do the Lord's Supper at the end of the message so please please be prepared I actually just spilled my juice and had to restart my whole message again but obviously God the Holy Spirit must have wanted me to restart it again so here we are restarting it uh, I don't have any other announcements, obviously. Today is April 17th, year of our Lord, 2022. He is risen. It is a Resurrection Day celebration. We will do the Lord's Supper at the end. So we are getting ready to jump into it because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, and like newborn babes, Long for that pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. We're getting prepared to take in the word of God today and certainly during the Lord's Supper. We must examine ourselves. How do we do that, believers? We name and cite any known sins. Wash ourselves clean, opening up the power of God, the Holy Spirit, which reflects the nature of Jesus Christ in us. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10. If we say we have no sin, believer, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, believers, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Let's take a moment of silent prayer right now. Get ready to worship our Lord. Celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Be filled with the Spirit, reflecting his nature. And get into the word and the fellowship accurately. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. But Father, we thank you for this time we had to come and study word. And Father, we're just asking that a message like this reach out to everyone, believers, unbelievers, wherever this message goes, let it enlighten, let it open up the hearts of even the hardest people, Father. And we're celebrating that resurrection, that empty tomb today, Father, because we know what it means as Christians. We celebrate. We realize what that means. We, too, are going to be resurrected in the exact same fashion. And, Father, we're just asking for healing hands across this world with anybody struggling recently with medical, physical, financial issues. Father, vaccines and viruses across the world, lies and manipulation of leadership and the media. And Father, confusion and division, we're asking for your hand on all these things. And we're asking for the bright light of the truth, your word, to shine above and beyond everything else, guiding us. We're asking for all these things through your Son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And today, I think, is a good message if you have family and friends, and you have some unbelievers in your circle of family and friends, this is a good message. I firmly believe that. So I think it's very important. The gospel is always important to get across. But today, more so than any other day of the year, you really want to emphasize that empty tomb and what that means, folks. Resurrection. We will do the Lord's Supper at the end. Please be prepared. You can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, royal family. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to touch into 1 Corinthians 15 today. Not right now, but in a little while, so be prepared. As we've studied in recent weeks, certainly even recent months, being in the Gospel of Matthew as we've been, our Lord became the Passover Lamb so that all of mankind would have the penalty of sin and the stain of the old sin nature completely removed. The debt was paid. The justice system was satisfied by that sacrifice upon the cross at Calvary. Never question that. Everything in Jesus' ministry pointed to the fact that he was the Passover lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Passover 
lamb for all of us. He wanted to be sure his disciples understood this. So he spoke plainly to them during their final meal together. We recently looked at that. His teaching and parables spoke to who he is, who he will always be. It brought to light a new dispensation and it showed us the future millennial second advent return of Christ. And the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught daily about all these principles for three years. His emphasis toward the end of that three years was to open up what? To open up the principle of the true Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That his disciples, his future teachers, his future church leaders, apostles and disciples would understand that it's always been faith alone and Christ alone. He is the only way. And he is the risen Savior. But what does this mean for you? What does this mean for me? If Jesus really was the Passover lamb, then what he did by dying on the cross was more than just another crucifixion of a rebel leader, a human prophet, as some historians have called him. They don't doubt that Jesus walked the earth and that he was crucified. They couldn't find the body. They just simply call him a rebel leader or a human prophet or a very nice man or a church leader. Lots of little fluffy names. But it's much more than that. It was the ultimate sacrifice for provision from God. Since Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for the whole world, does this mean everyone is now free from the bondage of sin? You should ask yourself that. Because scriptures tell us what he did took taking away the sins of the whole world. And when Christ cried out, Tetelestai, it is finished on the cross in the original language, that was retroactive. It touched back to the beginning of time and in the present tense went all the way forward, meaning it's always been finished. It will go on to be finished. It was complete. It is always faith alone and Christ alone. So Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice for the whole world does this mean everyone is now free from the bondage of sin? If what Jesus did upon the cross dealt with sin once and for all mankind, that's what it says, if you understand your Bible accurately, is everyone guaranteed salvation? Is everyone guaranteed salvation? I would tell you, not necessarily. That's why the importance for an unbeliever in this message really shines bright. Not necessarily. The work of Christ is never in question. And it fulfilled above and beyond its purpose. Yet why are so many people destined for the lake of fire? Why was hell coming across in the teaching of Jesus Christ so much? Why was it coming across in the apostles? Why is it in scripture so often? Why are some destined for the lake of fire? He took away the sins of the whole world. Remember the Passover story of Exodus? The Exodus generation, slavery in Egypt, slavery to sin, slavery to what? The cosmic system, the Exodus generation, and the original Passover story? Only those who applied the blood of the lamb to their house were saved. Those who painted the doorpost of their lamb almost in a cross-like fashion were saved. In the same manner... Only those of us who have applied the blood of the risen Savior to our hearts will be given freedom from spiritual death, separation from God. We then share in his resurrection, his empty tomb, his resurrection is our resurrection. Application of that blood, what does that mean? Application of that blood is simply believing upon the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Do you know who he is and recognize he's the only avenue? He's the only way. A application of that blood simply means believing upon the person and work of Jesus Christ. I will leave that slide up there as somebody recently told me. They appreciate when I leave the slides up a little longer so they can take the notes, writing them down, not only taking them through the eye gate and the ear gate, but writing them down, which is, I know, how I learned 
as a, as a pastor myself. The first Passover was in Egypt. Egypt represents what? The world. Cosmic system. Trapped in the bondage of sin. The first Passover was in Egypt when the spirit of death brought destruction on the house of Pharaoh. As what? As judgment for his harsh attitude toward the Israelites. He would not release them, though he kept making promises with Moses and Aaron and playing games with them. He had a very harsh attitude about the Hebrew people, the Israelites. The Lord instructed Moses to have all the people of Israel to make certain preparations, a certain type of meal preparations with a lamb, and place the blood of the innocent lamb on the doorposts of the house. Many of you know that story. It's very symbolic. There's a lot of analogies written in that, and we understand that if we've studied our Bible accurately. The blood of the lamb placed on the doorpost is the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, the lamb of God, that we ourselves have placed in our soul structure. The blood of the lamb would be a sign for what? Angel of death. That a provision was made for those inside that house. What do we often call our structure, our soul structure? A house, a dwelling. The blood of the lamb would be assigned to the angel of death that a provision, something was already taken care of. A provision was made for those inside that house. And death would pass over that house. Pass over. Death would not be experienced by those with the blood of the Lamb applied to that house. Just as the believer has the blood of the true Lamb of God applied to their soul, and his righteousness carries them across the justice system into freedom and eternal security. That's what you get. The righteousness of Christ is the only thing recognized and pure enough to get through the justice system of God. Many of you understand that if you've been with me for six months or a year or longer. Just as the believer has the blood of the true Lamb of God applied to their soul and His righteousness, Christ's righteousness, carries them across the justice system, the work is done, into freedom and eternal security. That righteousness is given in the form of what? A new nature, a new spiritual creature created inside of that soul, created and breathed into that soul structure at the moment of salvation. Many things happen at the moment of salvation. Forty or more. We've listed them before. It is a nature which is part of what? Jesus Christ. You actually have a peace of Jesus Christ given to you. Your nature, that new nature, is Christ-like nature. The unique God-man can never be altered or taken away. Nothing can destruct the nature of Christ. Destroy it, alter it, or change the nature of Christ. This divine union, which is eternal. Eternal means forever. Now, there is no beginning, no ending with eternal. This divine union, which is eternal, is only given one way. That is why the Bible says the gate is so narrow. And that is why Christ said, I, I came to bring a sword, not peace. Because when you give somebody a narrow option, they will argue against it. There is only one way. It is faith alone and Christ alone. That's the big illusion. Satan will have you believing in a God, and he's fine with you studying about a God, and even portions of the God in the Bible, but in one name that puts his back against the wall is Jesus Christ. Perhaps you've never heard that before. I don't know. Perhaps you've never heard any of this before. It is a recognition of the fact that you are a sinner in need of a Savior first and foremost. If you don't need a Savior, then you believe you can save yourself. It is a recognition of the fact that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. You recognize deep in your soul structure something's missing, something's wrong. You've missed the mark. You need help. And that is the only one, only one who is uniquely qualified to save this lost and dying world 
the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Just as certain as that fact, you were born into a sinful world, that's a fact, with a nature that is stained by the original sin of Adam. You can't do anything about that. It's the old sin nature. We have it within our DNA. You were born into sin with a sin nature. Helpless and hopeless. It is just as certain and factual that you will die in that sin nature at some point in the future, separated from God in an everlasting state of torment, unless, unless you have that old sin nature nailed to that cross at Calvary. It's a symbol. It's an analogy to have that old sin nature nailed to that cross at Calvary. It's very factual what I'm teaching you today, that you will die in that sin nature at some point in the future, separated from God in an everlasting state of torment, unless you have that old sin nature nailed to that cross at Calvary. There's only one way. Only then you are given a new nature through Christ, faith alone in Christ alone, which guarantees a resurrection as factual and real as the one Jesus had some 2,000 years ago. Same resurrection, you're guaranteed. The same Lord and Savior of the Old Testament is and was the same Lord and Savior who went to the cross in the New Testament. There was no difference. Those Old Testament believers were retroactively cleansed by the work on the cross. Retroactive means backward. What Christ did on the cross also covered every human being ever born from Genesis to Revelation. Those Old Testament believers were retroactively cleansed by the work on the cross. They had faith in the one true God and the one true Savior for all mankind. It's always been Jesus Christ, Old Testament or New. Hebrews 13.8 tells us what? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's eternal. Hebrews 13 eight. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The fact of the resurrection goes beyond an empty tomb, folks. That's historic. In the secular world, cosmic system, there are historians that will tell you, yup, Jesus Christ was real. He led, a he led a rebellion, he did A, B, and C, and they killed him and crucified him. And they put his tomb, body in a tomb of a wealthy man, but the tomb ended up being empty. The boulder that took three or four strong men to move was re rolled aside. The body was gone. The competency of the witnesses speaks to the fact that Jesus stepped out of the tomb. They were competent witnesses. There were hundreds, possibly thousands, but recorded in the Bible, hundreds that saw him for 40 days. The resurrected Messiah walked with and talked with many people. Hundreds saw him. Credible, credible and intelligent witnesses like the apostles and the apostle Paul being one of them. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. You guys should be there. Let's read that together. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I handed down to you as a first importance what I also received, the Apostle Paul teaching the church at Corinth, that Christ died, the Messiah, for our sins according to the Scriptures. He fulfilled everything. Verse 4. And that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Everything He said, everything written about Him, happened exactly as He said it would. In fact, there are over 250, close to 300 scriptures that are very prophetic about the life, the death, the burial, and Jesus Christ himself that have all come to pass. And many are still coming to pass in the near future. 1 Corinthians 15, 5. And that he appeared to Caiaphas, Peter, the little rock, the little stone, then to the twelve, in all twelve, would go to their death, proclaiming Christ, the Messiah, risen. 1 Corinthians 15, 6. After this, Jesus Christ appeared to more than 500 
brothers and sisters at one time teaching and preaching, most of whom remain until now, obviously Paul back then speaking, but some have fallen asleep, some have passed away. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, his half-brother, and to all the apostles, 1 Corinthians 15, 8, and last of all, as to one untimely born, the apostle Paul, speaking of himself, he appeared to me also. He stood in front of Paul after he knocked him off a horse and before he blinded him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And also, Saul, the apostle Paul, would later be taken up to the third heaven with Christ and taught mystery doctrine face to face with the Lord in the heavens and brought back to earth. Those who witnessed to his resurrection were those who knew him and therefore could not be deceived. A lot of people don't understand that. Why was it hundreds of already, already uh, we would say, born-again believers, the majority who knew him? Some who didn't believe, but they knew him. Those who witnessed his resurrection were those who knew him. Therefore, they could not be deceived. And all their witness accounts were exact because they knew who he was. People like his disciples, his loved ones, his friends, his family members, his followers, those who knew him best saw him risen from that tomb. Furthermore, they would rather die then changed their testimony, and many of them did die and didn't change their testimony. The very fact that they would rather die than change their testimony is the highest standard of a witness you can ask for. Think about that. That type of commitment of testimony is beyond reproach. If you have somebody with a good reputation and they're intelligent and they're telling you something, and you're saying, listen, if you're lying, we're going to torture you and put you to death. And they say, no, I'm standing by what I'm telling you. And they're willing to be tortured and die. What greater witnesses than that? Who is willing, let me ask you, who is willing to be tortured and die for a lie? Then ask yourself, how could you get dozens of people, dozens of people to submit to the same lie and face death? Torture and ridicule. How could you get dozens to submit to the same lie? After that cross, the disciples were in despair. They were frightened. After the resurrection, they were joyous and fearless. They were filled with a courageous attitude beyond their own capabilities. Almost like something magical had happened that it had. The day of Pentecost was the proof of the resurrection. It was prophetic that occurred 10 days after his ascension and session, 50 days to the time of the crucifixion. The day of Pentecost came. 10 days after what Christ ascended back after his ascension and session. Peter's first sermon, first one, preached in the church age, Acts chapter 2 into Acts chapter 3, was the birth of a new movement. The divine power and change of these men became very obvious as Peter touched on a message of resurrection, some of it from the Old Testament, Psalms chapter 16. Again, I'll leave this on the board. Powerful, powerful men who were just prior to days or weeks, we would say, prior to were afraid because of the crucifixion that happened, but the risen Savior, three days after the crucifixion, everybody's attitude changed. And then on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came out upon the church, you felt this obvious power and change, something supernatural took place. And you could see it in the apostles like Peter and John, and obviously later, the apostle Paul. Saul, who was fighting against Christian, had a miraculous change. These men were teaching and preaching like seasoned scholars, not fishermen. Teaching and preaching suddenly, fearlessly, like seasoned scholars, scribes, Sadducees, or Pharisees, blowing them away, not teaching and preaching like fishermen. 
The fact that the observance of the first day of the week as the worship day, Sunday, became enacted. That's how Sunday became enacted in the church age. Think about it. He was risen on Sunday. This was a radical change from the seventh day of the week, Saturday, Sabbath, observed by the Jewish culture under Levitical law. What a radical change. Under Levitical law, a whole bunch of them changed that were following Jesus. And Sunday became the day. Think about that, folks. That's a radical change from the seventh day of the week Sabbath observed by the Jews under Levitical law. The historical birth and the existence of the church itself points us to the resurrection. If you study the historical change at that moment of time. The church depends upon the resurrection. The church depends upon the resurrection. Christ is what? The head of the church. He must be alive to be the head of the church. He must be alive to be the husband. And the church age believers are his bride. We're the future bride. We go up. What do you think happens during the seven year tribulation period? When the believers go up in the rapture before the seven year tribulation, that is our wedding ceremony with the Lord. And it just so happens that in the ancient world, certainly the Jewish ancient culture would celebrate for like seven days for a wedding feast. And seven years is the tribulation on earth. We celebrate with our husband, Jesus Christ. Resurrection is a New Testament doctrine, though, listen to me carefully, New Testament doctrine, though it is mentioned in the Old Testament, you can find scriptures and prophetic things about resurrection in the Old Testament. It did not occur. Contrary to some people teaching, it did not occur historically until the human ministry of Christ on earth, the humanity of Christ on earth, the Christocentric dispensation. Just the theological word meaning Christ on earth. The Christocentric dispensation of what? The hypostatic union. If you've been with me for a while, you understand. The theology behind the hypostatic union is when Christ, Jesus, became 100% man while, while remaining 100% God. This had to occur and culminate at the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. Its completion came once Christ, it's called the session, once Christ sat down at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Just as the completion of the church age will come at the moment of the rapture. There is an end to the church age, it's coming, the moment of the rapture. Just like there was an end, we would say, to that time of the doctrine of the hypostatic union. Now Christ always remains Going forward, 100% man, 100% God. We barely can wrap our finite minds around it, but he does. But this all had to occur. This all had to culminate at the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. It's the completion came once Christ sat down at the right hand of God the Father. The work was done. Tetelestai, it was finished in the past and going into the future. It's always been finished. In fact, when God said... In eternity past, speaking to the Trinity, we will have a Savior for this fallen race. And Christ said, I will do it. At the moment he said, I will, in his deity, it was done. But just as the completion of the church age will come at the moment of the rapture. The great power experiment of the church age is completed at the rapture of the church. Just like the great power experiment of the hypostatic union terminated with the resurrection, ascension, and session of the humanity of Christ. It was complete. It was done. There was nothing left to do. Next step comes what? The rapture. Seven year tribulation and the second advent, second coming of Christ. Remember, there is a difference between a recitation, resuscitating someone, and resurrection. You've heard the medical term, resuscitate. There's a difference between that and a resurrection. 
There could not be a resurrection in the Old Testament, for the first resurrection in history was that of Jesus Christ at the end of this great power experiment that we call the doctrine of the hypostatic union. Jesus Christ is the first fruits. You've heard me teach that in recent months. Jesus Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, which means what? Gone home to be with the Lord. Nothing can change our coming resurrection, royal family. You should be excited. Nothing can change the course you were put on toward heaven at the moment of your salvation. Nothing can change it. Because Christ's tomb was empty and he was resurrected, therefore you are in union with him. Romans 8.38, what does Paul teach there to the Romans? For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, the list goes on and on, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nothing, Paul is saying, Romans 8.39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can never lose your salvation. That's blasphemous. Amen. Romans 8, 38, for I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers. Paul is saying there's nothing you can list. Verse 39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I challenge you to find a teaching when Jesus Christ said, you will lose your salvation if you do A, B, and C. And I know scriptures you're going to throw at me, but it's not Christ teaching, you will lose your salvation. You won't find that. Turn to Philippians chapter 1, royal family. Philippians chapter 1. You want to rejoice in something? Rejoice in eternal security, never to be taken away. You will be resurrected. Turn to Philippians chapter 1, royal family. Philippians 1. As sure as the oxygen that fills your lungs right now is sustaining your life, and it is because God's giving it to you, is the assurance and certainty that all believers will receive the same resurrection our Lord demonstrated and lives in right now and for all of eternity. The same. Other than those who go up in the rapture, listen to me carefully. Other than those who go up in the rapture, which could happen at any moment, it's evident, all believers will die once. Unless you go up in the rapture. All believers will die once. What we call a physical death of the body. Yet we never experience a spiritual death and separation from God. Never. Your spiritual death is taken care of. Psalms 116.15. What does it say there in Psalms 116.15? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. He takes it very serious. Precious, there's love there. He brings them home. You're not rotting in a tomb somewhere. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says what? For we walk by faith, not by sight, Paul teaches. Verse 8, but we are of good courage and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home face to face with the Lord because he knows what that means. What death means for a believer. Do you? Know what death means for a believer? Why do you think the Apostle Paul was so confident? 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 8, But we are of good courage. We prefer rather to be absent from the body. I'd rather be out of here and be face to face, home with the Lord. Your resurrection is assured. It's assured. And yet if you doubt the resurrection of our Lord, how can you be called a Christian? How can you? There's no doubt of the resurrection. It is promised to you. Is he a liar? Is he the author of confusion? I think not. The day the tomb was empty was the rock-solid guarantee that you will be one day face-to-face -face with the Lord in a perfect body. I know we look in the mirror, we don't think so, but oh yeah, it's coming. Perfect resurrection body. Be able to do what the Lord did. Walk through walls, sit down and eat. All kinds of wonderful things the Lord did in that resurrection body. We too. Resurrection Sunday. 
is the celebration of what we know is just around the next corner. Philippians 1.20, you're celebrating what's, a, what's guaranteed around the next corner. Philippians 1.20, look what the Apostle Paul teaches there. On the basis of my confident expectations, the Apostle Paul says, Philippians 1.20, and hope that I shall not be put to shame in anything. In other words, I'm confident I don't, I'm not going to be put to shame in anything I'm telling you or teaching you. But in all boldness, Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body. I'm in union with him. Whether by life or by what? Death. I'm in union with him in life and death. Verse 21, for me, Paul says, living is Christ, but dying is even a profit. It's a gain. It's even better. Living with union with Christ is a wonderful thing, but to die is even a better profit as well. There's even more treasure to gain there because I'm in union with him, resurrection. Philippians 1, but if I am to live on in the flesh... This will mean fruitful labor for me. In other words, I have a mission. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm a spiritual warrior for Christ. And I do not know which to choose. <laughs> Look at what Paul's saying. Death or life. <laughs> the Apostle Paul was so sure of the heavenly future. He's been there. That lays ahead. So sure of his own resurrection that he was telling me his followers at Philippi that he was struggling with the desire to go be with the Lord Jesus Christ or remain on earth and be a church leader for a while longer. He was kind of struggling with that. Gosh, I don't know if I want to stay here in the flesh and keep teaching you and follow through with my mission here on earth or go be face to face with the Lord. I'm kind of excited to be face to face with the Lord. Philippians 1.23 But I am hard pressed from both directions. Having the desire to depart and be with Christ face to face but that's very much what better. Why do you think some pastors teach the accurate doctrine of celebration for the death of a believer? Yes, we're sad we miss them and lose them. But we celebrate for the death of a believer. Philippians 1.24, yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sakes. In other words, others, what happens at maturity? You start thinking about others. Paul knew his mission wasn't done. Philippians 1.25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all, with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. In other words, I have some more doctrine to feed you. You have to grow a little more. My mission isn't done. Verse 26, so that your pride in Christ Jesus may be abundant because of me by my coming to you again and teaching and giving you more truth. The true Christian recognizes the resurrection, understands it. The true Christian recognizes the resurrection is that which Christ gave us to follow him to heaven. The resurrection is that which Christ gave us to follow him to heaven in the same fashion. We're excited by the thought of the resurrection when we understand it. We rejoice in the empty tomb. His resurrection is our blessing. Physical death is nothing more than a momentary valley you pass through. It's like going through an intersection. You navigate through it, and it's over with. Psalm 17, 15 says, What well, as for me, while everybody else is passing away, I shall, be, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. Speaking of death, and you get into Psalm 17. Speaking of death and then saying, well, I'm going to awake from death. And I'm going to face your face, your righteous face, Lord. I'll be satisfied with your likeness because I will be like you when I awake from this death. 1 John 3, 2 says what? 1 John 3, 2 on the board. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. What is John saying there, 1 John 3, 2? Beloved, listen to me. Children, we're children of God. It hasn't even appeared yet what will be God's working on us. You don't know the end result. He does. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him 
just as he is. John is teaching two principles there. One has to do with the second advent because we don't know when he returns. They didn't know when he returned. And the second principle part of that is you are Christ-like in your resurrection as well. Listen, folks, we do not race toward our deathbed, nor do we fear it once it arrives. Only God knows the exact time and the road of each and every human experience. Where it ends and where it had begun are in his hands. But the Christian who is educated knows the empty tomb was the fulfillment of a promise that each believer will receive, matter of fact, will receive the resurrection just as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his humanity arose from death into eternal life. Think about this. Is there any sporting event, winning lottery ticket, or human celebration or party you know of that can bring you greater reason to celebrate and overflow with joy in your heart than the empty tomb of Jesus Christ? Good question to ask yourself. There shouldn't be. There shouldn't be. His work upon that cross was more grueling and painful then we will ever wrap our finite minds around. We might never understand it. Yet it was the greatest act and sacrifice of his love for all mankind. A lot of people want to talk about love and salvation. Listen, you have to understand the justice system of God. But his love for us brought him to that cross. Those who love him, those who hate him, and those who could care less about Christ, all received his atoning work and the redemption from an everlasting slave market of sin. Let me say that again. Those who love Jesus Christ, those who hate Jesus Christ, those who could care less, sadly, than many about Jesus Christ, all received his atoning work and the redemption from an everlasting slave market of sin. Yet many will never accept that which he already did for us. That's the issue. Many will never accept that which he already did for all of us. Instead, in the end, they will stand upon their own merits and their own arrogance and make that choice. The time to choose is while you're alive. The moment of your death, your race here in the world, in the flesh, is over. There's something else begins at the death. He is alive, amen? He was risen from the death into eternal life. He has sat down at the right hand of the Heavenly Father, awaiting His people, His family, His bride, His body. Today, you do not celebrate a myth or a silly little story or possibility of what might be to come. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Today, you celebrate, the, you celebrate the truth and fact that Jesus Christ is risen fact. The Savior, the unique God-man who paid the penalty for all mankind is no longer and was no longer in that tomb. Goes much beyond an empty tomb. Because he walked through God's divine justice system for us and took the strike for all of us, we are redeemed. We are given eternal security through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. You simply need to believe upon him. His resurrection is our resurrection, royal family. I ask that you bring him into remembrance today and every day. And today we will do the Lord's Supper in a joyous celebration that he has been resurrected and seated in his throne of power in the heavenly places. It is finished. We are to follow behind him, and that is only because of his love, his work, and his sacrificial death for us. Let me say that again. We are to follow behind him in exact fashion, and that is only because of his love, his work, and his sacrificial death for us. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul doing the Lord's Supper, therefore be prepared. 
1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread, verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of our Lord, I ask that you eat this bread. First Corinthians eleven twenty five. the Apostle Paul goes on to say, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you shall proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Let us drink the cup. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and celebrate this today, Father. And we're asking each and every day for that light of truth of your word, the mind of Jesus Christ to reflect in our life, to shine in our life. And Father, we just give thanks for all you have done for us. We're so grateful for that empty tomb. And today we celebrate that through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.